With that, I shall now invite Jim Crosby up for our first presentation of the day. And Jim is discussing human responses to perceived aggression. The dog is growling, now what? Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm actually in a little bit better shape today than I was yesterday. And so things are progressing. I haven't died yet. So um, this morning, we're going to talk about uh, human responses to what is being labeled as aggression, and whether it is or not. Before we kick that off, I do want to acknowledge our, our generous indigenous hosts that have uh, invited us all here onto the land they care for. And also I want to, again, if I didn't get it through yesterday, thank AIAM and AMRIC for having me over and for all of you for showing up and coming back and uh, being here to support this whole project. So, how do we so survive encounters with dogs without losing our minds or a chunk of our body? Because that happens. Okay, we, we touched on this yesterday, but I want to reinforce it just a little bit. Behavior is not some super secret club that uh, only the few are allowed into. Everybody does behavior, it's just what we're doing. And aggression is nothing more than a group of behaviors with a purpose. So if we understand that behavior is just doing and aggression has a purpose, it helps us safely and properly interact with aggressive beings, whether they're dogs, cats, people, octopi, whatever. Um, communication. How do dogs communicate? We heard a little bit of that yesterday, but in looking at dog behavior, about 95% of the, of the communication that we can sense from dogs is through body language. Now there is a, an, a totally unknown world of scent out there. I would love to be able to see what my dog can smell for an hour. I think that's about all I could take before my brain exploded. But there is so much but we, don't, we can't even quantify it. So we're gonna, we're gonna push that off to the side. We're gonna keep it in mind for things like looking into bite situations and so forth as to how that may affect their behaviors. But honest to God, folks, when, if we say, well, we think it's because the scent was different, we're just bloody guessing. That's all there is to it. There's a lot of research been done on scent by those who are using dogs for for instance, finding substances, for doing conservation surveys and so forth. But at this point, we're going to talk about the communications that we can participate in. Um, I was a police officer for 23 years before I got off uh, and decided I'd had enough and they could all, all the younger guys could do that and got into this. And, um, a lot of the communication signals that dogs use are not completely different from signals that we are used to appreciating between people. They're faster and a lot of times they're um, a bit more subtle, but that signaling is the basis of communication. And it's through communication that we can interact safely with either strange dogs or problem dogs or other people's dogs or at least how we can get the message across that we have a purpose also that they can understand. So we look at the elements of communication between dogs and dogs and between dogs and people. Instead of words, they're using gestures, groups of gestures and movement and so forth. So, for instance, we want to look for things like body orientation. Which way is the dog facing? If I'm going to, and I'm going to use you as the example here as a target, if I'm standing here and I'm looking straight at you and I have my eyes focused on you, 
and my body is frontal, and then maybe I put my arms out, that's challenge behavior. That means in American, I'm gonna kick your butt. Um, that is a message. But if I'm standing here and then I turn my body slightly to one side and I look at your shoulder, even four or five degrees difference, now I'm saying, maybe we can talk. You, you say something back to me and I'm going to be able to understand how to send something back to you. And it, and it sounds silly, and we're going to talk about it a lot tomorrow, but when we're dealing with these dogs, we can use the same signals. Um, who in here has ever read uh, On Talking Terms with Dogs by Turid Rugas? Yay, there's plenty of people out there. Who is familiar with the work of Roger Abrantes on Canine Good? Um, and I, I think, who is it, Brenda Aloff? came out a bunch of years ago with a photographic guide to body postures. This is communication and we can use it to send and receive. If I give a, my body a, a little bit of an angle and look away and the other dog looks away, I may respond by licking my lip. That's a signal that transmits the message that I want to communicate and I may not be a threat. And yeah, it looks silly when you've got a person standing there licking their lip and yawning, and the dog is do but the dog is doing the same thing back, and then maybe the dog initiates the transaction. So communication, things like body orientation, where your face is, movement, position in kennels, um, all of those carry messages with them. Well, why do we want to communicate? or I'm going to introduce this word, we're going to go more into it, and then tomorrow we're going to go in even more into it, the word negotiation. A negotiation is a strategic conversation between two parties where both parties have something to gain and something to lose. And negotiation is what's conducted when you're trying to get both parties to a point that they can work together and each party can fulfill at least some of their needs. By doing that, we can build relationships. So, why do we want to communicate and why do we want to proceed by negotiating? We want to show a dog that we're not a threat. We want to make the dog feel safe and to help them meet their needs and to show them that we are a potential resource provider that can help them get what they need and what they want to survive. It's the process that I use when I'm dealing with bona fide dangerous dogs, dogs that have caused severe or fatal injuries. I communicate with the dog and negotiate them in order to build a short-term level of trust and mutual respect. Now, I've always liked that. Um, a friend of mine showed me that as being one of the principles of being a veterinarian. Uh, do no harm first, but take no shit. Um, it, it, seem, it's, it works for what I do. I'm not going to let a dog run over me and just do whatever it wants to. But I am going to um, show that I intend and uh, no harm and that I'm going to be a positive potential resource with them. So in dealing with the truly dangerous dogs, there is no way you're going to dominate a dog that's killed a 200 pound healthy adult male. It's not happening. The dog's gonna hand you your butt back in a lunch bag, uh, or you're going to be the lunch. That kind of behavior just simply makes things worse. Force begets more force. Negotiation helps you not need to find out that you're not the baddest dog in the kennel at that moment. Negotiation is based on communications. Communications have to be clear. The message we send 
has to be received and understood. The message we receive, we have to understand. So we have to have a common basis of language. I am sure here in Australia that if I went out into some of the more remote areas, I would be completely unable to effectively communicate because until we've developed a relationship, I don't have the same anchor points and interactions that the people living in those areas do. Yes, I might come in and act like I'm the big spiffy guy from outside that's going to tell you what to do, but I don't understand the situation because we don't have that commonality yet. So negotiation and actually getting somewhere is based on communication, it's based on trust. It's not based on fear. Yeah, I was a police officer for many years and there are some situations where respect and trust was great, but fear was a heck of a lot more useful and wound up being something that worked quicker. That's an exceptional situation and in a lot of cases is probably unnecessary even that. But it's based on trust. Negotiation has to be based on mutual respect and involves giving and taking. It's not you just walking up and saying, dog, you're going to do this because I'm the human with two legs and I said so. No, it doesn't work that way, especially with significant aggression cases. So, how do we start that communication? Well, here's an, uh, a, a picture from uh, the hurricane that hit New Orleans back in 2005, Hurricane Katrina. I was on the ground there for over a month, and that's where I was able to hone a bunch of the, the techniques that I've since used. But the first thing to, in negotiation is you want to address the problem at hand and look and see, okay, can I de-escalate whatever is going wrong? I've walked around the corner, there's a dog there that do doesn't know me. Can I use signals and communication to first de-escalate and turn the volume down on everything? And then can I use that to take time to build trust? And we do that by using the signals that we know that we can both receive and give, take it slowly, build that trust, and our body position sends as much information as the dog's does, even if we don't know we're speaking. The dog knows we're talking, so we have to be aware of not just what the dog is doing, but what we're doing. Now, some of the speakers yesterday, we were, talk that we're talking about the five domains. Remember those when you're talking about communication because the five domains have purposes and those purposes can be served by communicating and also the communications can be rooted in those uh, domains, those purposes. If a dog is hungry and you've got the food resource, there may be communication, but until you at least temporarily solve that nutritional challenge, the dog's only going to be listening to part of what you've got to say. If the environment is chaotic, shelter environments are chaotic, which is why we have a tough time communicating in shelters. But if the environment is chaotic or threatening, um, the, the, the old joke in Florida is that it's hard to remain, remember you're there to drain the swamp when you're up to your butt in alligators. Uh, here you have crocodiles which are even nastier, at least that's what the myth is. Um, so the environment has a lot to do with communication. We can't always take the dog to a quiet room though because that's not real life. Health, if the dog is not healthy, Communication is going to be affected by that lack of health, whether it's they have a raging ear infection and can only hear part of what's going on, whether they have visual deficits, or whether they just feel bad. Uh, I was not communicating day before yesterday when I arrived here very well with the hotel staff. Um, opportunities, does the dog have opportunities to exhibit and enjoy and live through normal appropriate behavior, and what's the dog's mental state? 
if when I come up to the dog to try to evaluate it or interact with it at the shelter, bless their hearts. And, and for those of you who've never been to the southern U.S., bless your heart is a polite term that grandmothers teach you to use that means, what a dummy. But bless their hearts, sometimes I'll, I'll get to scenes or get to shelters, and the staff, either knowingly or unknowingly, has been cranking the dog up before I got there by doing dumb stuff. So I've got a dog that's highly aroused and is not in a good mental state, and they wanna say, okay, Mr. Dog Whisperer, and yes, I hate that term, but okay, Mr. Dog Guy, um, do something here. It's like, okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna throw you out of the room. And then we're gonna sit down and we're gonna to try to get this dog back to a more accepting mental state so that we can start communicating. Because yelling at each other isn't necessarily the best way to communicate. Now, can we do this? Yeah, this is not whispering. I'm not whispering to a dog, they're not whispering to me. We're speaking in fully clear, normal tones. Um, if the dog has to raise his voice because I'm not listening because I'm a dummy, they may be showing teeth or doing other behaviors to raise their voice, but we're, neither of us are whispering. And communication with dogs is not for the special, it's not for the select, it's not for the magic people, all of us can learn those signals and use them. And it's amazing the first time that you actually deal with a dog that's showing you um, negative behaviors of one sort or another and you start using the signals and you see the light bulb go on in that poor dog's head going, oh my God, there's finally somebody who's listening. It's a wonderful feeling and it's a wonderful thing to experience. So we can all do this. We use, again, body language, posture, expressions, our physical orientation, and movement to communicate. Now, when I explain to people uh, the basics of assessing what a dog is saying and thinking about what you're saying, I broke it down, and this was part of my, the training that I do for police in the U.S. because in the U.S., all of us police are walking around armed to the teeth all the time, and the first response is to shoot anything that looks like it's shootable. And so we've been trying to reduce the number of officers running around and shooting people's pets by teaching them the differences in body language with dogs and with themselves. And the quick assessment that I teach goes through seven points. And these are general points and there's other bits and pieces but we want to look and consider as our primary communication tools things like eyes. Where are they looking? Is it an easy gaze or is it a hard stare? Do you see the whites, the sclera of the eyes? Are they avoiding and are they looking at anything but you in order to avoid contact? Ears, up, down, left, right, um, tight, loose. Uh, I, have an accent, not just because I'm from the South, but because I can't wiggle my ears and move them very much. So speaking dogs, I'm slightly impaired. Where's their head? How's it facing? What are they doing with it? What is the mouth and teeth situation? Do you see teeth? Is the, is the mouth open? Is it shut? Tails, people put a lot of um, credence into tail movements. I'm also impaired in that in that way that I can't express much with my tail. Um, posture, movement, tension, these are all categories of features we can look at. And when we're dealing with or confronting or having to interact with a dog that is showing aggressive displays, we can use these to communicate and to help us from being bitten and from, to help the dog reduce the likelihood of being improperly or unjustly judged in a way that, that is negative for the dog. We're gonna go through a little bit of this body language. Again, the eyes, they can be hard or soft, they can be round, squinty. 
where they're looking. One of the things I want you to keep in mind, and we forget it, is that one of the easiest and earliest physiological symptoms we see in dogs of stress, of uh, the beginning of the fight or fly response, is pupil dilation. A dog that is stressed or a dog that is fearful or simply trying to figure out what's happening, the pupils, boom, open up. Why? Because we have an animal that's trying to gather all of the data possible to be able to assess what's really happening. And you'll see that the pupillary dilation is in is not consistent with the lighting around them at the time, but the pupils, boom, go wide open to gather everything they can gather. That's a subtle signal. It's the earliest we can tell of beginnings of stress or panic or related behaviors without having some kind of a, a blood level or heart level monitor uh, set up something we should be looking for. That really helps you get an early warning that, okay, th this is not Fluffy who's comfortable right now. Let's think about what we're saying and what the circumstance is. Ears, again, up or down, text, tucked or relaxed. Um, head, looking away is a very common response for a dog that wants to de-escalate. You're looking at the dog, the dog looks away, and um, tomorrow we're gonna show some video where you can see that the dog is actively looking anywhere but at the perce perceived threat. Anywhere. I mean, it's obvious they're ignoring it. What are the mouth and teeth doing? Well, in both of these cases, you can see the dog's bottom teeth but you have two different sets of behaviors. So we want to see things like the mouth shape. We want to see tension or relaxation. We want to see, and, and the, the word for today is agonistic pucker. That is when the dog contracts the, the area between the lip and the nose and exposes those upper teeth. That's a real, real clear signal of one of two things. Either you've got a Chesapeake Bay Retriever who does that because they smile all the damn time. Um, and and the, I love Chessies, they're great and they do that because they're, they're happy. But um, usually what it means is you're fixing to get bitten. That's the last warning sign you're gonna get because the teeth are coming your way and they're gonna engage. So agonistic pucker. You can really impress people sometimes by going, oh, did you know your dog has an agonistic pucker? And they, they start looking around them and going, um, where did this come from? So anyway, it's fun to mess with people. Um, look at the tails. Tails can be misleading sometimes. They can give you general guidelines and taken in concert with the rest of the body picture, they can be a pretty good indicator. However, if you have a dog, for instance, that's been trained in police or military or protection sports um, that is ready to rip your head off, they may be very highly focused on you and they're giving you the agonistic pucker in the growl and that tail is going like crazy because dog knows fun time is coming, I get to eat, I eat somebody. So you gotta look at the whole pic picture. Posture, how are they standing, where's their body weight? Are they lifting paws? Are they facing you fully? Or have they put their body to an angle in kind of a crescent shape? That tells you, for instance, that they want to de-escalate things, that they're starting to feel uncomfortable, so they'd like to turn down the volume again a little bit. And movement, of course, back and forth, can uh, you know, show us. As I mentioned, I think I mentioned yesterday, uh, the idea of closing the gap. Is the dog approaching? How are they approaching or are they keeping distance? Uh, this is a dog who is maintaining distance. Number one, look, 
This dog is looking everywhere but at the camera. The dog does not want to engage. This is a poorly socialized, at this point, fearful dog. The dog's body is at an angle. The head's at an angle. The mouth is closed, not showing teeth, not tense, but closed. And as the cameraman moves around, the dog moves also in response turns its body to the side and stays as far away as possible, retreating from contact. Again, as the, con as the camera moves, the dog is watching and keeping an eye. Uh, the lighting isn't good enough here where you can really see it, but this dog's pupils are totally blown. This dog is getting in every bit of data around it and is trying to send uh, retreat signals, withdrawal signals, appeasement signals that are not being returned by the camera person. So you can see the messages this dog is, is sending. This is a different dog. What is this dog looking? Uh, uh, what is this dog saying? This dog is saying, I am going to kick your rear end. We've got hard eyes. The pupils are still wide, but it's fixed. The mouth is tight and closed. The ears, well, they've been done by the home Ronco cropping job, but um, the, the ears are up and if they were intact, they would be focused, for, you could tell they were focused forward. This is a dog that actually did kill someone and this is the dog that was probably, there were three dogs, but this was the dog that was probably the most involved. This dog I was able to build a relationship with so I could get hands on and evaluate him, but it took a while. We had to develop at least a short-term level of trust so that um, neither one of us got injured. And it was difficult with this guy. He was very standoffish and um, would have been very rapid to escalate to a physical confrontation. So we need to put those postures together. And that is how we can deal, at least in, in my experience, how we can deal with, it, with uh, dogs that are showing overt aggression or maybe showing fear and be able to evaluate how we proceed from there without necessarily getting, getting bitten, eaten, injured, or the dog getting injured. Uh, this, these are pictures of an, the same individual dog. These are the two pictures from the day the dog came in at the Bahamas Humane Society in Nassau. This is the, the same dog, Mickey, when we adopted him out a few months later. Now, notice not only the condition or the improvement in his physical condition, uh, he had horrible... Uh, skin issues going on, he was suffering from Ehrlichia, he was suffering from malnutrition, all those things stacked against him that we often see in challenged communities. Uh, I'm familiar with it in the Caribbean, particularly in, mostly in the Bahamas, but we see this in the Bahamas, we see it down in Puerto Rico, we see it in places like the Dominican Republic, in Jamaica, those Caribbean destinations where these are generally free-living dogs that are supported by a group of families. Much like the situation that I'm understanding more and more you have here within the indigenous communities where there are community dogs. Um, also though, look at the body posture difference here. Not only have we improved his health, but we have improved his situation and his, his confidence his mental health. In both of these positions, we see so many fear indications. But Mickey, and for a while, he actually was kind of our yard dog at the shelter, running around and interacting with people and other dogs. Look at that face. It's confident. He's relaxed. The pupils are normal. They're, they're constricted because this is taken in the sunlight. His, not only has his fur come back, but his attitude has come back. His presence, his ability to interact with people has recovered. And the 
the, the messages that he is sending is much, are much, much different. Now this dog, I want you to look at this because this is a bit of a different situation and I'm, I'm sure that there was more going on with this dog, but I want to show this and then we're gonna just not go through the formal process, but generally do the poll on this. Watch that behavior. The teeth chattering is actually very unusual for a dog that's not trying to get to a, uh, a female that's in season. He's biting and lunging at that fence. He's lunging at my, my Kevlar glove. He is so aroused that he's about to turn himself inside out. But he throws in appeasement gestures every once in a while. He is so conflicted that he can't decide, you know, what, whether to have dinner or go bowling. It's, it's, he's in a horrible situation. His mental health is not good. His quality of life is not good. Now, I was never able to get this guy out of the kennel safely. They could only move him on the end of a catch pole, which of course just made the situation worse. No, please, when someone tells you they're great working with aggressive dogs, if that means that they're really good with a catch pole, that means they're not really good with aggressive dogs. We had plenty of people who have responded to various disasters that have come in and say, oh yeah, I'm great with dealing with dangerous dogs and blah, blah, and everything they do, they hook up and they, they, they dangle it and throw it around. And in any case, that was just, over the top levels of arousal. So how do we deal with a dog like this? Well, we can't really approach him fast, at definitely. We can't just tell him it's gonna be okay, even if we use language he understands. Giving him just a cookie and then throwing a leash on him isn't gonna work either, because that dog his level of arousal is way, 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 way too high. And if you try with a dog that, this wound up, that is this wound up, even if you've got a fresh steak, the dog may grab it and take it and then it's gonna spit it out because the level of arousal is too high for that dog to be able to take in anything in a meaningful way other than a full panic. And no, <clears throat> that's what they had done was they had left it for the catch pole guy but the, the answer here, and what I did trying to work with this dog, was to take my time, I reduced my profile, let him settle and tried to connect. And literally with this guy, once I realized what we had, I simply went a couple of feet away from the, 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 the wall of the kennel there and uh, to give him a little bit of mental space, as much as I could use there. And I sat down with my back to him and I waited and waited and waited and waited to see if he would de-escalate to the point where we could begin a conversation. And it, it never happened. He never calmed to that point. From our side, um, we need to remember that we are sending those messages as well as we're receiving them and that the messages we send may be making our jobs easier or harder. There are, uh, dogs do respond to audible cues, not as much as we communicate because our communication is mostly vocal, but our voice and pitch and, and patterning does affect the way we're perceived by dogs. Usually a slightly higher pitched, gentler, softer tone will help us communicate to the dog that our intentions are not as invasive or pushy. Loud, uh, forceful use of voice can be a deterrent for some dogs, but it may crank others up. Um, if we have a dog that's been in part of human society, try a couple of commands. If the dog is being aggressive and we're out in the field and we're trying to get them to either not 
attack us or to be able to work with them on a short term, try looking. I, t I tell the police officer, if the dog comes around the corner and is barking at you and, and giving you the evil eye, try, try saying, hey, sit. I have seen it happen so many times that you do that and the dog goes, oh, that's what you want me to do? Okay, plop. Here, here's a cookie. Holy moly, it's different now. This guy understands. But we want to try to make our first contact with the dog on as low key level as possible. We've talked about the eyes and the teeth, but we need to think about our eyes and teeth. Where are we looking? If we're approaching them, looking dead at them, and again, say we're happy. Okay, I'm coming straight at you with my teeth showing. The dog's going, this is a problem. They're staring at me and he's showing his teeth. He's got the agonistic pucker going here, guys. What's the next step? I'm going to have to be ready to defend myself. How is your face oriented? Again, how are you, what messages are you sending in dog language? You know, little child running up to see the dog and it happens all the time, kids get bitten. Why? Because you've got little Susie that decides to go see Scooby and doesn't realize it's Scooby-Doo, or actually it's Scooby-Don't, not Scooby-Doo. So she runs up with the big wide eyes and the teeth showing and her arms out shrieking, ah, oh, Scooby! And then we wonder why when she grabs the dog around the neck, she gets bitten to the face. Well, did she ask for it? Not really, because we don't want to blame kids for stuff, but in dog terms, was that provoked? Almost certainly yes, especially if it's a dog that is not socialized with children. Position, again, our body position, are we invading their space? Are we sending a message of threat or are we sending a message of de-escalation and reassurance? Um, our apparent size. If we look bigger or look smaller by crouching down, that affects the perception of what we're doing by the dog. And are we approaching or are we retreating? If you're gonna retreat from a dog that's threatening, that's threatening you, don't bloody run. That's just gonna make it worse every time. And I guarantee that there is nobody in this room, including me, that can successfully, for more than just a very brief uh, period, outrun a dedicated dog. I used to run years ago marathons, and I've run a four minute and 14 second mile. 99% of the dogs out there can still catch me that fast. So don't run. Instead, hold your ground and try and negotiate. Here's an example. What do we see here? Are these hard eyes? No, they're not. Are the ears tight or back or pinned? No. Are the pupils dilated? Yes. First physiological sign of stress. Dog's not showing the agonistic pucker, but by looking and seeing this, we can tell that there's potentially a problem coming. So we can turn down the volume very quickly. This is my dog, has, uh, uh, he's wonderful, he's, uh, he's actually Australian. He uh, came from a breeder out in Cockatoo Valley uh, where we had sent four generations previously one of our curly-coated retrievers to them. He's got all of these loose behaviors and even though you can't tell because he's a curly coat, he doesn't have the hackles up. So there's there are no warning signs here. So to round up, uh, communication is essential when we're dealing with what we're labeling as aggressive or dangerous dogs. The message we send has to agree with the message we want to send and also has to be the same as the messages that are being received come up to, but we can learn that language. Without communication, we just can't do it. So, thank you very much. 
Uh, we're going to go into this again a lot more in detail uh, come the all-day session tomorrow. Thank you for your attention and I'm out. <laughs>